Okay, Nico, we're live. Thanks for joining me on the show. The floor is yours to start us off. Why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself for my audience and kind of just give a little bit of background about who you are, what you're building. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Connor, for having me. Um, yeah, just brief background. My name is Nico. Um, I'm a founder in, uh, of um, two businesses at the moment. So it's uh, two startups. One is uh, ex actually the, 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 the framework for building startups. It's a company builder we've built in our home region uh, in the northeast of Germany. So I'm coming originally from an island. I'm an islander and now here coming uh, talking to you from Berlin, Berlin, Germany. And uh, the other business we build is uh, a remote work business because we believe that, yeah, all those uh, ways how to travel, how to work uh, will change, and we want to offer flex work models to, yeah, to businesses. And I'm always curious, how did you make your way into the entrepreneurial space? I'm assuming you were not always a founder, an entrepreneur. So maybe if you can kind of talk about that, uh, maybe even your early career and then the transition into entrepreneurship. There were a lot of transitions. Uh, so um, um, one of my uh, life themes, I would say, is uh, only those who change uh, perspective can create something new. So I, I really believe in uh, this kind of development. Again, coming from an island, uh, it was very yeah, uh, um, all the people who, who, who are jealous because I, I, I grew up in a, uh, at the beach. You know? So for me, it was since uh, the age of 12 or 14, I <laughs> wanted to go to the city. So, uh, um, and um, yeah, uh, it is a rural region. 90% of Europe are somehow rural regions. Uh, and in the industrial age, uh, uh, you are as in, uh, being in a rural region, growing up in a rural region, you are somehow second class, right? So, and your parents tell you, I better get a job in a city. So, uh, and there were not too many options for me as well. So, um, I thought, like, they told me, uh, find an institution, find a job. And uh, I found the German army. So, I became a military officer. So, uh, that was my first stage because I, uh, it was somehow possible that uh, uh, the German state will support me. You, you see, it's very far away from entrepreneurship. The German state will support me in uh, getting my studies done and funding it. So I thought like, hey, this is a good idea. Uh, years later, I uh, was a military officer still in a company chef, a company commander in a mission in uh, Afghanistan. So, hey, find your safe job. That's not really what my parents uh, told me, but they were very happy being in a German army. But hey, that was the first chapter, did some studies and finished with an MBA, but finally said, okay, what is the next stage? Um, went to the big giant industrial giant Siemens uh, in, in Germany. Uh, they um, started as, and that was very good, uh, as a CEO assistant. Had, um, yeah, after 12 months, um, uh, all the people somehow trusted me and the board. And so I could take over a head, the global head of product management for signaling stuff, transportation stuff. So Siemens is building trains, right? And all the technology to uh, bring trains from the uh, one station to the other stations even as well building the tech uh, the strategy behind is uh, buying countries right so uh, acquiring countries uh, and so because these are very national markets uh, super interesting and uh, yeah 2012 13 14 15 when in the us already there was a transformation uh, the the digital transformation, uh, mobility, transportation um, uh, business, right, with Uber and sharing economy and so on. We started to come into that age, and I was um, then uh, these times uh, responsible for digital transformation and uh, all that stuff. And um, yeah, that mean meant uh, technology. Siemens is super in technology because we had a lot of money, could invest in all technologies um, and and uh, bring the. Um, uh, existing technologies uh, with sensors into a digital age, right? Processes, um, I could motivate the people to invest into processes, digital processes, because we could save money and costs. So everyone was following also that directive. But culturally, I had no plan what to do. How do we bring this pyramid, this industrial giant um, and the transportation segment into a, yeah, a, glue, a, a future business, right? And that was um, something where some of my colleagues then um, recommended me to to this community and co-working space uh, factory Berlin, and uh, yeah, um, and I, I, I give it a try. I gave it a try, and it was something where university, school, uh, old company, also uh, uh, industrial companies and startups, and even uh, artists met in one place, right in one building, and that was something what I what fascinated me and. Uh, um, and we joined with Siemens with 20 people, with 20, 20 members, because I thought this is a new world. This is how it should be. 
and uh, exactly um, uh, I criticized, uh, I, I was super in that topic. Even I was strategic head uh, by, of the Siemens Mobility uh, Unit, was super in that topic, and I was fascinated. I studied business psychology in parallel just voluntarily because I thought like, hey, what is about this human being changing in a network society? What is that? And I found that this is the space, this is the place where people learn by serendipity, right? So because of the people are, uh, who are around you, surrounding you. And that was... Uh, so, the reason why I often not uh, just use the classical office, which we had a lot of thousands of square meters in the northwest of Berlin, but I was in that co-working space where I had nothing on my own, right? So I shared space with others. We had one lab for Siemens, but this was um, where I often um, tr um, uh, work from there. Even it was not as comfortable as in my classical, but I worked from there because of all the different and, and that was the reason why I was super uh, convinced that this is the concept probably for future work and blah, blah, blah. And so I criticized a bit also the community because I thought it could be better, even, right? So, and we could have more impact because the founder was looking for a Mark Zuckerberg of Germany. And I said, hey, we are an industrial country. Why, if we look for Mark Zuckerberg and you do not find that, what? did we do then finally uh, this is an industrial country with a lot of small and medium-sized companies if we help them to transform if we help them to find new ways of work if we help them to um, understand how we learn and progress uh, that would be huge impact on germany which is 80 uh, percent industrial so um we, we we discussed a lot and then he found somehow hey this guy has yeah, I, I was in, he, he felt that, and he offered me to become the CEO, a bit closer to uh, entrepreneurship, but even still only the CEO, uh, employed CEO, but of the biggest interdisciplinary um, startup ecosystem in Europe. So at the end, we had 40,000 square meters. We had more than 200 startups being part of that ecosystem, supporting that startups with all they need space sure but with a network we created the network that all um, of the entrepreneurs from the beginning got uh, access to technology access to investors etc et and um, this place was some of for me uh, originally again from the island was something like okay this is the future world right so we do not just all go to the manufacturing uh, uh, location or the factory production scene so in the post-industrial world uh, places to work have to look like this and um, impact has to look like this and creative work has to look like this. And so I thought back from my hometown, uh, how can we transport something like that to rural regions? Because I feel it's regional development. It's not like bringing big companies to the rural region, but bringing those ideas, this uh, entrepreneurial thinking, this uh, action from my rural island to the US to, to everywhere, right? So it was possible due to digitalization and globalization if you are not cautious or if you are uh, bold enough to do, if you're bold enough to start. Right, and that was something where it was not the problem uh, being in Berlin uh, to be confident enough that uh, uh, we can start with that. So um, that was the idea. And when we also brought in uh, next to Berlin and Hamburg, we had the chance to go to Albania, <laughs> to Albania because uh, we got a, a call from the prime minister that we should go also to Albania. And that was my dream. Uh, actually, it was my dream because we could create the uh, ecosystem there. But I felt like, okay, I have to start in my home region first. There are 16 federal states in Germany, and one of them is uh, Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania. It's ranked 16 in all disciplines regarding innovation, employment rate, and all that. So it's 16. So I started uh, uh, building the company builder with uh, friends of mine. Uh, and uh, yeah, the next level is now that we built this new business where we really founded um, the vocation startup Project Bay where we are in now and um, yeah it's the second year we are awesome yeah so a lot to unpack there i kind of want to even just back up to the beginning right when you're a young person and you decided to go into the german military what did that teach you i mean you made a comment about how it's almost like anti-entrepreneurial right a lot of structure hierarchy discipline yeah. what did it teach you what skills did you develop and would you recommend right other maybe a young person listening to this you have a decision you know, you're 18 or whatever, what to do with your life, would you recommend that path that you took? I mean, was it worth it? Or is there a better way to, I don't know, enter the, the entrepreneurial space when you're younger and 
and say, maybe don't join the military. It's interesting because it's a huge political change due to the uh, Russian-Ukraine war at the moment in Europe. So with mm -hmm. the discussion, right? Because normally I would have told you, okay, uh, there's a completely different understanding of army officer percept uh, military perception. But now it's into the direction that uh, I... Also, discipline. Uh, I was very introvert uh, 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 coming from school, right? So you can, I cannot imagine, but I was very introvert. And then all of a sudden, as an officer cadet, I stand there and I had to, no, so uh, even be louder, right? So, and then I was like, okay, coming uh, out of my comfort zone. So that's, I think, very entrepreneurial, right? And then to take leadership, even I was 19, 20 years old, right? So where these uh, uh, patterns uh, which were taught. And I think I thought like, wow, this was super good for my development, for my personal development, because I would not have, uh, yeah, I would love to have uh, the comfort zone, like going to an institution, right? And, and, and sit there somehow. But I was pushed. I was really pushed. It was not my decision. I was pushed. Uh, every day, right? In three years uh, officer uh, um, uh, training, I was super pushed. And of course, I would recommend it because of the uh, traits which you can uh, uh, derive from that, namely discipline, um, that definitely see your own um, um, limits and see that it is it's even more what is doable, right? So that's definitely a, a, a one thing. And responsibility, taking over responsibility. So uh, there's also a kind of East German uh, cultural bias, I would say, in me, which is a very collectivistic as a Uh, following someone who's saying something, right? There's still transformation ongoing here in Germany, but I am the third generation of those who are definitely confident enough to be um, that we can say, hey, we can change everything. Military, again, I think military is something what definitely um, I would nowadays, 2024, recommend. Uh, but uh, if we would have the same discuss discussion in 2022 or 2021, so before the, the war and even the understanding and consciousness for that here in Germany, um, people would say, yeah, it's nice that you recommend that, but uh, in this um, society, and uh, we never need something like that again. That's German perception of military careers, right? Even you know that there's, there are benefits, also leadership traits and so on, but it would not be socially accepted. And that's different today. Okay. No, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and would would you say, so it sounds like there's not an interest from young people in Germany. And I would say it's even the same in the United States. Maybe it's more of a generational thing. Like as the, the younger generation becomes older, there is less interest in joining the military or following that as a path. I mean, would you say that that's a fair assessment? I mean, I don't know if it's it's kind of fallen out of style or there there is a desire from the younger generation to try other things when traditionally the military, maybe in the United States or regardless of country, seem more of a traditional path. I cannot judge or assess uh, the United States. I've been there probably 10 times, 15 times, and I had the feeling it's right. It's there in the perception across the societal uh, areas, right? So you are in the football game every uh, break, you stand up for someone, right? So and that or there's a tank in front of the f football stadium, so. I was like, okay, this is not doable, right? So this is not doable in Germany. So, uh, um, um, mm. and so the recruit, it, it's all over there, right? Even, and yeah, there are alternatives, right? And alternative path is entrepreneurial. Okay, I'm smart enough to identify a market or a problem. I have the technology. I can somehow try to solve it here from my uh, home office, right? So, and uh, I can uh, go with different people who have the same wives. And um, on, also, there is a growing option and attractiveness of going other paths. That's the one thing, also entre uh, hashtag entrepreneurial uh, paths. And on the other side, um, um, I'm also writing an article, wrote some articles on that. Um, if there will be a Russian attack towards Europe, who's there to defend Europe? So if there was 60, 70, 80 years of no war in Europe, so there's no uh, societal acceptance of military. So there's no, so, and then now it's a question. So we, the, the, the war economy uh, was just, I think, by 60%, uh, it was grown or increased in, the, in, in Russia and all the neighbor countries start to follow now, right? So, but uh, it is not just uh, increasing budgets, right? It is really, really across all societal areas that uh, we have to think differently about military. And I would say from my far away perception to the U United States, I would say, hey, what uh, the, the, so the, so, um, the acceptance in the society is 
by far higher than here in Germany or in Europe, right? So <laughs> it is. It was um, there was a duty to go to the um, so the, the, the was 2011. They draw back the the, the law, but the, there was a duty to have either this ser a military service or something like um, an alternative service. But this is not an, any longer there, and so it um, even I as a military officer after 12 years decided to not going into this reserve thing, right? Because I thought this kind of army no one needs in the future. And now I'm back in the reserve, right? Because I said, hey, uh, if not me, so who was trained and who is somehow uh, has an understanding of who else should do it because we have so, uh, so we have no, 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 no skills for that, right? So it is really, uh, there's a growing entrepreneurial uh, scene on defense tech now that's really, really growing here in, in Europe. You can see that it's a huge market as well. So both disciplines come together, what we are talking about, right? Entrepreneurial thinking and military. So, and we also perceive the Ukraine that there are a lot of, um, there is no other option. So we have to think innovative and disruptive, how we can solve this huge enemy and we smaller, how we can address that, that we survive, right? You see really like, I don't want to say parallel things, but it's really, a lot of innovation here is going on and somehow those two disciplines partially merge. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I think maybe the point I would make from the United States, at least, you know, me growing up here and spending my whole life here, I, I agree that Germany and the United States you can't really compare from a military perspective. But I would even say in the U.S. there's less appetite for the United States to become involved in conflicts that are halfway across the world, right? If you think back to the early 2000s and the Iraq war and wars in the Middle East and everything. Like, I, I just think there's less appetite there as well. So it is interesting. Um, um, and it's an interesting part of Europe and, and the future. Um, and maybe if you could speak to that mindset, right, that there's been no conflict in Europe for so long. I know off off camera, we were talking about how you're a fan of, of Peter Zihan and, and geopolitics. But I think the history of Europe and even the world is that there were constant conflicts, right? And there were there was this period where there there weren't conflicts. So I don't know how you think about that. If you think that perhaps technology, entrepreneurship, whatever it is, can kind of prevent that from reoccurring, or if you, considering your experience in the military, are, are skeptical and think that that you know, as we kind of Ego globalize in certain senses that we head back in that direction. I mean, I don't know what your your perception is. Is do do we kind of continue the way we have, where relatively peaceful, or does is the Russia Ukraine kind of the beginning of of broader conflicts? Um, yeah, so definitely the latter one. So it is difficult to uh, create pattern global patterns no? because as you said deglobalizing we see that the the world order seems to to change that there are multi orders no? so multi power uh, uh, world and again that's one of the pictures you hear here is um if there will be a president trump uh what will be the impact on nato and support for nations uh, uh, uh military troops right so that's one of the uh, urgencies in the pitch you know? so to say hey what what happens here um and if there's no support any longer so and the 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 uh, um, percentage in gdp was never hit by germany it's a recent 10 years you know? so how much do i invest into uh, 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 nato it is two percent was is the hurdle right so and, and it was never hit it was always uh, lower and that was trump's point when he brought that up and said okay i don't know whether i will support you next time and um and the funny thing is, I think we are now at 3.5%. Right? So it was 100 billion to additionally invested. And I cannot talk about uh, global issues, but I can tell you uh, there was 70, 80 years which uh, brought us a kind of, we will ignore that there is this option so of war. Yeah? And all of a sudden there was something like that, which is very close. There's only Poland between Ukraine and Germany, right? So, and so that... It's, it's it's an option and it is even a higher threat with knowing that there's no that there's a geopolitical change where it is not like in the cold war or very clear if one is attacked of the nato all will uh, be together and attack the one who's attacking us but uh, if there is a questioning of who's supporting even if china and taiwan right all those actions and the very east probably this is on the uh, priority list of the us i don't know but for us it's very clear 
um, only the military uh, point, we have to be ready to defend ourselves. That's basic, basic, basic. Ah, Maslow pyramid uh, on, on, on stage, uh, on nations, I would say that's so basic. We talked about being the technology leader. We talked about how can we be on one level with all the big global players. And uh, uh, I agree to Peter Zion, demographic change. And so we, are, we, we would lose this game. But there are other industries like um, yeah, renewables or there are... Uh, um, there are new working models which we are probably bringing into the market where we would say we have to see what differentiates Europe from other continents, from other uh, countries. And there are options um, where he sometimes for me is too deterministic, right? So there's geography, there's demographic change and one more thing. This is the equation. This is good to start thinking about that. But I also see, uh, yeah, it's also provocating me and we will also have ideas, right? So we also will have ideas on that. But the most important thing on your on your question, the most important thing is we would never have thought that something like a Russian attack on the Ukraine will have happen again. So there's a lot of, uh, um, um, yeah, we have to catch up there, right? And that's changing the way how we think about globalization, because even how we think about sustainable development goals at the moment, if we think about climate change, uh, you see that if there is an investment uh, and it is about defending your country, defending the, the lives of your families, uh, this is prior one. And so no, it's very difficult to talk about prioritizations and no politician would say what is the positioning and the priority. Uh, here's very clear. Um, the risk is too high to ignore and to continue talking like, hey, there will be a strategic chance for Europe or Germany to go for renewables. Yeah, of course it will be there, but the super, super urgent thing is catching up um, the, the defense capacities capacities we need to have. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. It's something that can't be ignored. Um, and it, You mentioned something, so maybe if we pivot a bit, I think uh, considering you and your being in Germany, the demographic crunch that also yeah. Peter Zion talks about, I'm sure you're aware of. I mean, is that something that is actually affecting the German economy currently or the way that companies are hiring and the ability for Germany to continue as an industrial power? Or or how are you looking at that from like an entrepreneur, right? Um, because in order to fund renewable energy or fund building these amazing startups, you need the young people to do so. So is that a concern of yours? Um, and if not, why not? Or how big of a problem is this going to be? I mean, our, our business exactly should address this lack of talents. Uh, but uh, just to Peter Sion, energy, he's completely right, right? We made ourselves dependent on Russia. Oh, uh, now we have to change that. We made quick, very quick changes. So uh, alternatives, even even LNG from the US, even LNG from the US, right? So there's a mix of energy. And I think uh, that was entrepreneurial politics, by the way. And you can laugh about that, but it is an option. And it was an option and it was implemented. Uh, I think Germany has the big, or we have the big problem. We have so much of our GDP coming from industrial times. Even you have uh, digitalization of the industrial power and the industrial uh, revenues, right? So that there is a limit. So, and if people uh, um, are very much thinking in the past and believing like, okay, more work in the industrial area, but there is no demand for the industrial product any longer. So there will be post-industrial businesses. And so we have a huge... Uh, history, which um, where people now look back and would say, "Oh, these glory times!" And we grew up and industrial power and on. And it's difficult to come like this um, for entrepreneurs. I'm like asked to say, "Hey, uh, there are so many options, but it's not to build the next Siemens here, right?" So it's oh, from, from the very much beginning there could be a Siemens in uh, in 20 years probably, but it will not be another industrial company it will be rather something what we now build is okay um, there could be an uh, an option to say how do i get more talents to to europe how do i get them right so uh, how the the, the the limited number of resources we have how do we get them in the companies who really are willing to spend some money on that and we are offering them that they work from the most stunning locations right so we are we have co-working spaces we, uh, we create professional working environments because this is a condition we provide them in the nicest regions 
in the regions like Ireland, like my home island, right? We have 32 locations now. And if people want to, to start their work life or they have no kids, they can every month work from a different location in Europe. So, and they will have their knowledge being integrated into the rural community, right? And that's something where we really thought through, is that something what can work if the big companies say, okay, I offer that to my, um, and probably some people from other continents will come to us, right? So uh, qualified people will come to us. So, and that's something where I would say, again, energy was a huge topic. Peter Sion is bringing that up. Fair point, change happened. Uh, but still, uh, how do I make myself so independent as the U.S. is, right? So it's a price-wise, it is a huge topic still. Um, Post-industrial games are created by entrepreneurs, not by the existing ones, but by entrepreneurs. So there is a scene who's driving it, but we are small still in comparison to the big industrial giants who contribute still more to the GDP. And again, next generation or also how do the aged ones behave who are still working, um, you see that there are different uh, needs that after the pandemic, there are different, uh, yeah, uh, that, 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 that um, it, we still, uh, due to the demographic change, we have an employees market, you know, so they can just bring up their, 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 their needs. And yeah, the war for talent is, is there. And that's the reason why we as a, as a company, as a startup said, okay, exactly this will be something uh, where we dive in right, with us. So maybe we could talk about Project Bay a bit yeah. more. So who is your avatar from a, a customer perspective? Is it those innovative tech startups or are you approaching kind of the old guard, the, the big industrial companies in Germany as well and trying to get them on board with this new model of working, this uh, new type of employee perk that I would imagine historically they would not believe in, right? Uh, if you go before pre-COVID, it's, uh, and I think you told me this off camera too, that some some German companies have gone to a six-day work week or, you know, I would imagine your time at Siemens, it's, it's five days a week, you're in the office, no, you can't travel to some far off island to work. That that makes no sense. You need to work here and be productive. So I'm just kind of curious how that, uh, because it's a it, it's a really cool idea from my perspective. But I, I would imagine for people that are maybe old school or have been working for so long, it, it's it's kind of like uh, what what are you talking about? Why would I pay for my employees to to vacation? They need to be here and working and, and be productive. <laughs> You know, for, uh, ju just to clarify, I mean, that's really the vocation image is really the worst you can have, right? So because if you start like vocation, as you said, that's more the vocation perception, uh, the vacation perception is always there. Or oh, you are stand up pedaling the entire day. And then uh, you, are, you tell me that you want to work from an island. Ha! <laughs> Yeah, I will believe that, right? So, or you want to work from the Alps. Yeah, ha, ha. yeah. so I don't trust you. So, And that's really industrial pattern. I want to control. I want to measure everything. I want to see where you're working. This is the industrial pattern. And of course, in big industrial giants, the culture is still there. You know? So they have the right ambassadors in the outside of the company who talk right but that's so far away from being implemented for 100 percent of the company it's not again and it's not like everyone should work from the beautiful island that's not what we want but there are people who are definitely remote working target and um, uh, even in the in the in the big uh, in the big companies no? so but they are uh, and they are and that's interesting a lot of them are going back to the office now and uh, they have however 40 days of mobile work policies right and so it is like the compromise okay let's come three days every week but for the other days i do not get uh, give you any kind of limits. that's how we enter those companies but as you said Connor, i mean the sales cycles with those big companies are no surprise huge right and that's the reason why we try to partner even with free uh free solutions would say if you go in an individual talk your personal development talk uh just offer our membership there and we give we give you a perk, and uh, we only go with one uh, partner per industry. And after twelve months, we will see how your employees are, have perceived that. So this is, the, but this is not the the crowd we are doing our business with. Right? So there's the digital nomads, which we have existing market, uh, but they do not go to those three stars, four stars hotels we have. So you find a community like. Uh, Hostel Plus, no? the two stores or something like that. This is existing, but they are not willing really to contribute anything to the region. They are not willing to spend any euro. So what we really want is that the employees of those big businesses 
finally see with their brain that they go to the different locations and work from there. How do we come there? Now we start with the industries where uh, remote work is, uh, is, is normal already and was normal before the pandemic, right? Means IT industry. So we have IT industry. We also, a lot of industries are sub industries in the IT industries, but IT industry generally is working decentralized. And so it's very clear once a quarter they want to meet in person. So it's good for an offsite to start like doing that in one of our base. Why to have a classical office you can do regularly in different, uh, your different offsites in different locations, right? Because we have community spaces, we have co working spaces uh, there, and you have a nice program around that. So um, you start to understand okay, the IT industry is something where people can, uh, if you want to recruit them, and you would say uh, company A has uh, the standard package, company B, uh, company B has the debate package, that means they can work from the most beautiful locations, right? And even they split the costs. The employer and employee can split the costs, right? So that you would say, okay, uh, it's 100,000 per year, and now we, uh, we offer you to pay 85, and uh, we will pay 30,000. 30,000 into this uh, hotel thing here, Project Bay Partnership. So that's how we get, uh, come into the market. That means with industries who have an understanding of remote work already or have the huge lack of talent, like tax consultancies. We were super surprised, comes out of the market. They have such a pressure that a lot of those companies who give 5,000 euro per year as a benefit to their employees, to their new candidates, they give 5,000 euro. Without any, it's just if you come to us, you get 5,000 euro, you can book via Project Bay. Um, you can work from everywhere there. So it's allowed 5,000 euros because they have such a huge lack of talent. And this is something where you see that even the founders or managing directors of those companies, they do not look for happiness of the people. They just have such a huge problem because they have no resources to hashtag demographic change again, right? And it is also not a really, really, really beautiful business, I would say, for a lot of... So there are personalities for this kind of job. And also technology will help us tomorrow, right? To also so substitute some things of that. And so I feel like uh, the industries who have the biggest problems are talking to us. And we do not start always with a disruptive membership. You can work everywhere, uh, every month from a different location, but with a, hey, you already have benefits, right? Five billion mar market in Europe. Um, there are benefits, your uh, gym, your transportation ticket, your internet uh, fee and so on. We take that over. Hey, and now 500 euro, euro more for Project Bay. You can decide one week on Mallorca in summer or six weeks uh, um, on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a normally summer island, but in winter, right? So, but you've been there then. So, and um, that's what is the entry door to this new market, which we have to build, but we are not crazy entrepreneurs and would say, hey, we built the blue ocean or we drive the blue ocean, but there are existing markets. And this is the one market is the two of us have their vacation. We have our vacation and we would say one day of the two weeks, I want to have a co-working pass in one of your locations, Nico. So that's making vacation and one day co-working. But there is nothing like a co-working space in those uh, at those islands, right? So this is not it's not existing. So this is one a very small market, I would say. And the other big one is uh, on the B two B side. It's benefits. Benefits are there, and if you have unique benefits, you can differentiate. And if there's a war for talents, you will win this war. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a really interesting premise. A um, couple more questions. I mean, do you have any sort of data that that solidifies for maybe a company that is skeptical that says, hey, if you send your employees to Mallorca, Spain, they are going to be productive and here's the data to back it up? Yeah, that was, I mean, uh, it's a typical paradigm or exactly what you said, uh, 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 where in the early pandemic, right, regarding productivity, it was like, okay, home office will not work, right? And then they said, what is the reason why home office not, is not working? Yeah, because people cannot deal with digital tools, number one, or people do not deal with uh, the right leadership for remote work, right? So what is the work principle in, in, in remote work? And you do not, in, in those industries who work already decentralized, you do not need data because they know that is working, right? And uh, what I always use is uh, PWC or EY, so some some neutral uh, uh, consultancies who show who are showing like this per, uh, uh, productivity figures are increasing along the timeline now, where 
people just had qualitative uh, statements, right? It will not work. So, no, and we, we asked 1,000 companies, it will not work. It worked. It works, but we have to say we are not happy with the productivity because we just built a 300 million euro real estate here. So we still doubt it, right? So and it's very difficult to say there's a productivity gain, but it's very clear uh, from the psychological point of view that if uh, you combine very good leadership skills means I expect you, Connor, if you go to this beautiful island there, I don't care how many hours you're working, but milestone A and B is what we really expect. You can always um, reach out to me in those kind of times. We use as a, and, and note, please, the progress in, in Slack and in Notion. And um, uh, as a standard module, we have our coffee time together or something like that, right? So it means you have to have the rules, how it works, and you have to have and if that if that is uh, prepared, and again we can learn a lot from those companies who did that before before pandemic, um, then it's doable. So I see that those questions regarding productivity come from individuals in big companies who are not used to remote work and all the implementation measures like how do I deal with digital tools, how do I deal with collaboration on individual level. Imagine that you have to talk to every individual. What do you expect to have as a working environment? Because they will be loyal there. But if you do not do that and still work like an industrial giant and say, okay, I want all my uh, people to come to the office again. All, okay, all. Okay, that's not smart. And also our solution is not for all, but it's probably for the small 20, uh, we say 15 to 25% of the, of the uh, working uh, people they are allowed to do that and they will stay. Who is committing to a company still, right? So no one, because you have a free choice and there's more salary, there's more salary. What can you do to make people committing to it? Yeah, you have to ask them what they expect and you can ask them, you have to tell them what you expect. This is on individual level, a lot of investment, future of work. But if you are HR and 50 years old, 55 years old, 60 years old, you are used to have a pyramid. You are used to say what the CEO is telling you and spread the uh, spread this message to everyone. But now leaders have to talk on one on one level, have to adapt again and again and again. And so, of course, software will enable that way. But culturally, if I'm not there and if I'm not ready to go for those kind of discussions on an individual level, I will not go for headache like remote work, huh? disruptive stuff like remote work. That means on strategic level, on management board level, there must be a huge problem. And this problem is. In IT industry, um, the opportunity cost, if I would have one more man here, I could have 80,000 more euros per month. But this person is not here. Okay, uh, what should I invest to get this 80,000 euro? If it is 60,000 euro profit on that, you can decide on 60,000 euro how much you want to allocate here. It's really about the lack of resources and entrepreneurs who have exactly, we have a lot of, I, I wouldn't believe that, but there's a lot of digital transformation business still. We thought like, hey, this is done. <laughs> but there are a lot of companies uh, who really tell, to tell me in the, in the pitch in the beginning, they said, hey, Nico, I don't want to sound arrogant, but it's not about the money. It's really, so we can invest here in benefits and we can invest in such a solution. But can you really guarantee no, and that's what uh, would be data uh, necessary. Can you guarantee that we then get the people? Because I want to have my 60,000. I want to have no, already 80,000 revenue. That's, that's really the data. And that's the reason why we said uh, we can um, really show that on small companies. But what we need now is the access to the big ones. And that's the reason that gives me the energy to talk to them again and again and again. Can we talk about the employee experience, right? Because I've experienced this in the past where you're in a, an amazing location, you're working remote, but you're staring at your laptop for eight hours a day or, you know, God forbid it's 10 hours. And then you say, <laughs> okay, great. I'm in Mallorca or wherever I am, but <laughs> I don't even get to enjoy it. So how do you address that? Or does that come up from the company perspective or from the employee inspector? perspective like hey thanks for offering this benefit but you know you you have me at meetings all day inside in a in a beautiful location so how do you balance that as so we went through that as a, i went through that same experience right? so uh, a, a curve and i think it's it's in our onboardings we try to bring everything what we've learned to the team right? and also to the to the, to the to the customers to the members but um i mean that's my recipe 
also my, my, my solution on that would be really the community because people really exchange in the kitchen, on our location, in the apartment, in the community space. And they exactly, I, I mean, I don't know how you dealt with it. The problem is if you are alone, again, if you are in a hotel and you work from there, no one is with you, right? And, or, or probably your, your, your partner is with you. But it is like, okay, and, and I had the same thing. I, in the kitchen, getting a coffee, I said, okay, I'm so stupid. I see the, I see the ocean. But I cannot enjoy the ocean because I have Zooms the entire day. I'm so stupid, right? And then it was like, and people told me, you know, Nico, what uh, our nomads here always do, they start at 4 a.m. and they finish at 11 a.m. So, and, I, and, and I, for me, it was very clear. They are super productive in these hours and they enjoy the entire afternoon and the barbecue in the community, right? So it was like, there are patterns which we can share, of course. But what the most relevant thing is, Uh, why you can't be, be on your place of longing? If I really talk about individuals, the, the one thing is our organizing all of that is difficult, right? So because in always different locations. So, um, second thing, I do not want to be alone. If I start now, I do not want to be alone. How do I ensure that in those rural regions, I do not meet the rural people only, right? So I want to I have a community where I can exchange. I, I'm not, I don't want to be alone. And number three, and this is the biggest thing, Because I have normally, I have to save 49 weeks per year to have three weeks of vacation, right? So I have to work, 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 and then I have three days, uh, three weeks of vacation. And please don't start talking about work then, because I have 49 weeks. But now, if you if you uh, kind of extend that line, I would say, hey, there's a merchant work and travel experience. Then you have this money, you have your employer probably uh, helping you with that issue, and we can offer because we have negotiations with the hotels for 12 months we can offer that by far below the normal vacation price right and that's something where we would start to say okay we will subsidize that right we would say what from on the level it's 1000 euro the membership now starts 1000 euro uh, one month in a hotel rügen mallorca alps wherever you want 1000 euro um that you start your 12 months of membership Right, so and you every month can decide to be somewhere else. And how is it do doable? Because we have the big businesses spending money in our, for their employees, right? So the two of us, we can uh, order something. But in, at the end, this big change, this big disruption, is only possible if there is a, a problem with the companies who pay value based. Then, but it's doable. So, can you get into what? the properties and the spaces are like you just mentioned hotels so i'm assuming you partner with hotels in these locations but then i kind of want to go back to how you said it's not good just to be in that hotel room by yourself like is the expectation that if you're an employee you show up to the hotel you are working in your room or is there like a an, an ancillary thing where the these hotels have set up co-working spaces and it's encouraged for you to work in that space i mean how does that work Exactly. So the the um, our idea is uh, at the end we are a platform bringing together uh, hotels who leave uh, 50 to 250 square meters of space to us, which we operate as a co-working space. So that's our competence uh, that we operate this that we translate also this uh, B2B requirements, the professional working environment. We create a professional work environment in this co-working space, but you will never go to Mallorca without being sure that you can sleep somewhere, right? And that's the reason why, of course, we also have, uh, we also offer that as a combination. You can sleep somewhere, you have a community space where you can be working with the others. Uh, so the, in the space, the, 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 the co-workers are as well. And we, of course, and that's one of the, knowledge, uh, of the experiences we have, there are two, three ways of work, right? So we have a campfire atmosphere there, so socializing. There's a desk area where you only can work and it's quiet. And then there's a modular event area where we can move the, the furniture a bit and equip it like, okay, here's a, uh, here's a session, a learning session, right? Which we um, uh, um, uh, regularly do so that there are learning activities and uh, uh, leisure activities as well together. And if there is deep work necessary, we ensure that we cooperate with hotels who have the option that you also can work from your room. Uh, so that's so that you say deep work i do not want to see the others right so i do i want to work from home but it's so important that i know that uh, that there's a community manager so we have one community manager and that there's that, that there's this community space where the vibes are set 
so that I do not feel like, and if you go to another location, it feels like the same signature, right? So, and that's so important for us that we would say, uh, we of course do a normal community management. So people tell their interest and we can then give their recommendation um, where they should go next. But the experience is a connection or a combination of uh, a, a digital and uh, onshore uh, community management. It is the co-living in, in the spaces or where to accommodate. Uh, it is the co-working space, and it's a lot of events which we which we do to also help the region to understand which kind of brains are there and how they can benefit. So, how does it work from uh, the hotel perspective? I would imagine they also serve traditional tourists. So, how does that mix where you have essentially uh, digital nomads or people working remotely, and then also digital tourists? Is it is it that you are kind of separating your space or it's like, hey, we already have this conference yeah. room and this is going to permanently be the project bay co-working space. How, how does that work? As we have to ensure if you if you let um, companies pay 6,000, 7,000 euro per month, partly for that. No? So you have to ensure a professional work environment means exclusive community and co-working space. Yeah, the hotel is uh, given that to us. Um, and uh, again, what has the... Um, I uh, missed to talk about the problem uh, of the hotels. We have seasonal businesses who continue to operate in the post season because they do not get the people again, right? So after the post season, so people will leave, they can't do no, don't come back. That's the reason why a lot of those hotels in touristic regions continue to operate, even there's no demand. That means they are super deficitary in the in, in the in the post season. So they need uh, uh, need new ideas, and that's the reason where why they listen to us, right? So and we would say, hey, we need some space, some space, but exclusive for twelve months. Let's test it together, and that's the idea where we now say we operate it, we equip it, uh, um, and we ensure that there's uh, <laughs> our friends uh, Starlink, right? So good that internet is working. Um, that uh, data protection VPNs is working, that ergonomic uh, uh, furniture is there because only that's the reason why tr we, have, we are trusted by the employers, right? So by the big ones. So, and that's the reason why we ensure the professional environment, even in the most stunning locations in touristic regions. And nowadays we also offer cities, even there are co-working spaces, but we our, uh, offer now also uh, cities because in the membership, you do not want to go from beach to mountain to beach to mountain, but you want to go to Berlin, you want to go to Paris, you want to go to London. So that's part of the membership as well. And there we also collaborate now with hotels. But it's definitely, as you said, it's definitely another talk to the hotels who say, okay, I have a utilization of 70% or 80%. And um, I don't know why I should give you uh, this kind of space now, right? So because they do not have this postseason issue, but they see the huge potential of the huge disruption we have in the work world, and they see a interested, uh, a very interesting uh, customer segment. They know B two B only from my business, no? from events and me uh, and conferences and so on. And there they see. Uh, the procurement guys who are negotiating like hell and every cent in the catering per or person per uh, per square meter, person per event rates. And we would say the B2B, the company is benefiting with higher productivity due to stress, reduce, uh, stress reduction and concentrated workload, uh, innovation networks, and number one, uh, employer attractive things. No? Also, that's definitely the number one thing. If I want to differentiate, I need something like that. So I kind of want to pivot a bit or kind of hear your take as, as we close out here. Do you have an overarching thesis on the future of work, right? Obviously, you're a fan of remote work. Um, you've worked in traditional environments, more flexible environments. I mean, do you foresee a future where this benefit that you are offering is offered by every company to every employee where it makes sense to work remotely. And I mean, are we kind of seeing the end of the requirement of living in a city because you have to commute to your office and you have to be in person? Um, and then one other point as well, you kind of talked about how digital nomads, okay, say, hey, I want to work from four to 11 today. Um, are we also going to move away from the traditional Monday to Friday, nine to five, work day where you have to be there during that time because this is what we work when we work and it's just how it is. I mean, do you kind of have an overarching thesis and, and mission statement about how Project Bay fits into that? As I would make a tick behind all the things you said and it's a, a, a timeline towards future on different stages, right? But the flexibility 
on place, the flexibility on time um, uh, for different industries. So it's not the hundred percent. This is you know, like the the. Um, but this is I I would agree to everything what you've said. Um, but the mission statement or the the most relevant thing is because I do not want to. Um, I think I'm a hard uh, hard believer in uh, what we do and what we offer that this is attractive and will be a future huge market and that you need a go to player. Uh, which is who's offering that and understands the B2B crowd, understands the working world. But the number one thing is the freedom of choice, the freedom of to, the freedom to say where I want to work. And my workplace is not the home office, is not the classical office, is not the co-working space in the city, is not the remote work location on the beach uh, in a professional working environment. Is, it is the freedom to choose because this is increasing the productivity. And after the pandemic, it's not possible to do any other move because there will be always an employer who's offering that to you. And so it is definitely, so I would say the, 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 the number one thing is I strongly believe that uh, the next huge thing in work is that what we felt in, uh, with all the disadvantages which we have to organize now, right? So, but the flexibility and stimulation behind changing the workplaces how you want it, right? And that's I've, I think it's a huge trigger for finally implementing sharing uh, sharing economy because you would not say it's sad that I will here living in Berlin for the next ten years. Yeah, why? Because if I have a a, a lower price for, uh, instead of the, the rent I'm paying here in a dense city. I love to be in a city, but there's a limit. And now I feel like I should be uh, um, uh, in Albania because they have such a nice coastal uh, area there. I want to be in Albania. Oh, that's doable. That's great. What is your, and then we try to get the understanding, what are the problems seen here? But our offer at the moment is just to say, what would be your place of longing, Connor? Ah, okay, in Europe, <laughs> I would say in Europe. And then I would uh, say, okay, that's cool because Mallorca we have in our portfolio. Ah, it is Greece. Okay, we just have something in Athens, um, but um, we also will have the other two islands there or three islands there, right? Because you said it and you see the risk in my business model, there's not, there's no risk because the hotels who go, go with us will super benefit from that, right? And we will benefit if there's some employers who understand that they differentiate themselves if they offer something like that, really, really credibly to the employees. So what's your overarching vision for Project Bay from a growth perspective? I mean, do you want to be the, the global leader in the space, the leader in Germany? You know, what are your goals maybe even over the next five, ten years? Yeah, no, that's, that, that, that's, um, that's an easy one because uh, we, we started and that's, again, uh, uh, Perfect, uh, probably a perfect uh, arc to the beginning. We started the, the, the entire thing because we believe that um, that we can connect regions, rural regions, and also all regions now with that, right? So if you have the, such a space, community space, and you bring together traders, companies, and and and, and regions, uh, so we will definitely have in the next uh, three years 150 locations in Europe. So that will happen. And then it's always the question if we understand the customer experience, the customer journey, the tech recommendation engine better, why should that be only doable for Europe? Right. So that's it is necessary to have an identity and bringing people together. So if I would say I can also, I'm super interested in connecting with Hawaii. No, because there's also from my island perspective, we have same problems. Why not connecting with Hawaii? No, so that's doable as well. But in Europe, we have so many things at the moment. Why I would say we have 1,000 locations in Europe in the next seven years. That's definitely uh, uh, one of our targets. And that means in 1,300 different uh, municipalities we have in, in, in Europe, nearly in every one, there's a project. Right? That's the that's our that's our vision. And again, the the, the basic principle as such, we, we can start from today in, in in the U.S. But I doubt that the employers are ready for this because we have a tendency in the other direction, and they, we have not probably not the same problem as 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 we have in Germany or in Europe with the demographic change, right? So things come together. That's the reason why we start the journey in Europe. 
we we will invest a lot of time talking to the big ones because we see a huge change uh, a chance for regions for the companies and for us as individuals and what is your biggest competition i would imagine there are others that have had similar ideas and what are you looking at from a competitive landscape perspective Sometimes I feel like uh, it was a, in an MBA course, like a uh, business model exercise we, we did here. So we, th we thought, what is the user experience and what a user expectation? So it's a professional work environment. There are companies in cities which did professional work environments, right? Co-working spaces. Uh, what about accommodation businesses? Okay, there are, are Airbnbs uh, where you are alone, where you are, have no real econo economic stuff and so on. Uh, there are hotels who are trying to understand B2B, but they do not do understand hospitality better. Um, we have Selena as a billion business from South America coming to the Europe, uh, but more focusing on B2C. And we have a lot of, which you have in mind now, a lot of companies trying to do the same thing, starting in cities. Because early adopters want to go to cities, they think, right? And I, when we think completely different, we would say, hey, it's more interesting to be there where your place of longing is and again their city is in the portfolio but there are some companies already there and we think it's more interesting to think about beach mountains and nature and then go from beach mountain and nature back to the city because we offer that to our members right and that's the blue ocean part where i talked about there are a lot of benefits you know benefit providers as uh, as i said um, but no one is offering they all offering the process the software for the process or you want to go to nice and in france in in august okay you have to click here your leader uh, your your manager has to click here and you have to put in the country and okay now we have the legal confirmation for that no one is taking care of what you actually do there and what is your environment so, so that's why we say flex work models for a modern workforce will be the differentiator and uh, there is a competition out there, so there's an existing market, but uh, what we target is much bigger than this. Okay, to close this out, one more question for you. Um, just knowing everything that you know now and building this company and your experience at Siemens, military, everything, what, what advice would you give your, your younger self? I think, I don't know by when it, it came, because I mean, hindsight, it's always easy, right, to, to formulate something, but uh, it, that, that there was this moment when I understood that as uh, jumping between systems, jumping between disciplines is a strength of mine. And I would, uh, it was important that I'm coming from a rural region. I'm, I was a, a military officer, which is again, far away sometimes from, from, from entrepreneur. So to running the journey and being interested or curious about things which are out of your comfort zone, to move this way. So I never, I never, you would say, what would I do different, right? So, and this wouldn't, uh, mm. would, would be, I, I would encourage myself to to do the step into the cold water, which I did, right? So I did, I did those steps, uh, but I would probably, I did that as well with alumni from, from the military office outside at uh, part. I, I helped them to say, hey, you can be confident because you have a great set of characters. You have a great set of leadership skills. You do not have to question whether you work in this economic world you know, after the military. So I said, after five years in Siemens, I said, now I feel like I can trans transfer. But I was uncertain on my own, right? After the 12 years as a military officer, how do I make myself? How do I, how will I be accepted in the, in the, in the business life? and so on so i doubted and hesitated whether it would be the right thing but i always did i did the, the, did the step and i don't know what will be the future but only those who change perspective can create something new so sometimes you really have to change your perspective and i don't know by again by when that started with me but um, this is the most uh, the biggest thing i understood on my way that uh, there is, there is, uh, it's worth to go for those experiments. It's, it's always worth to go for those experiments. If you give your energy in and are, are smart to adapt, it's always worth to go for this, uh, for those experiments. All right, Nico. Yeah, I think that's a great way to end. Um, to close this out here, I will give you the floor. Any other final thoughts and, you know, where can people find you and more about the companies you're building? 
Yeah, we just built, um, really appreciated our, our talk. Thanks, uh, Connor. And uh, really, I think um, what we what was relevant for us now, we are now in month 13 of the business. Uh, we have 17 locations, uh, 32 signed uh, for Europe, uh, the 150. I talked about that. Uh, we are actually in the, at the moment in the seed funding, pre-seed last year, now seed funding. Uh, we have... Uh, the uh, fifty percent of that is done, so I think um, this we we also will go now to uh, to the North American VCs just to understand better probably the scaling game. So it would be interesting to connect there. I think my uh, contact data will be here in the in the show notes, right? So that we that we share that. Mm -hmm. But happy to learn even more how to uh, scale the business because we have a lot of exponential growth in, in front of us, and I love to meet people who did that before. Uh, we have a lot of respect for that, but also we see a huge opportunity to build, a, as I said, the go-to uh, B2B platform for uh, flex work models. Uh, there will be a company doing that, and uh, I think we are ahead of the others. Yeah, um, definitely. I'll put all your contact info, LinkedIn, links to your website in the description Absolutely. so people can reach out. And yeah. yeah, hey, again, I appreciate you taking the time, and I wish you the best of luck. I think it's super cool what you're building. Thank you. Thank you, Connor.